Hey there, this is Mark, and I am stealing the Business of Unicorns podcast intro mic because I want to tell you about an exciting event coming up on October 22nd, 23rd. That's a Friday, Saturday. Michael Keir and I are doing once again for the first time in over three years inside the unicorn. This is our two day deep dive into the glittery innards of Mark Fisher Fitness. It's been a long time since we've done one of these, and we're excited to show you the exact plays that we use in Mark Fisher Fitness that have been responsible for lots of awesome things. And we will also, in our typical transparent fashion, show you the painful scars on our knees from the things we've learned the hard way over the past 10 years, and hopefully save you some time and energy and money. Now, what's awesome about this event is we're hosting it from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m on this Friday and Saturday, the 22nd, 23rd of October, and it's happening over Zoom. That's right, that means this is a virtual event. You don't need to fly anywhere. You don't need to get a hotel room. You can watch it from the comfort of your home, your living room, your office, your bathroom, and the unusual event in which for some reason you chose to watch there. It's your business, really, it's none of mine. And we are so excited to share this with you because we have a lot of amazing updates since the last time we did this, and not only that, but people that sign up for this course not only get access virtually, they will not only get a video of the course if they can't attend all of it live, but they get exclusive 90-day access to Unicorn University. That's our online learning platform that will let you check out any of the courses we've done in over the past several years of Biz for Unicorns. We're covering topics there like time management, the client experience, building a team. I'm very excited about this event. You are not going to want to miss it. Go ahead, click the link below or go to businessunicorns.com slash inside dash the dash unicorn. And we'll see you in October. Uh, I guess you could. <laughs> you went, what well, you a went. flawless start. I expected you to do it, and then you sat there silent at three, two, one. I was like, "Well, shit, is this me?" <laughs> no, yes. you do the intro. It's it's your podcast. I'm um I'm a pseudo guest, pseudo. I'm a team right. member who feels like a guest. <laughs> All right, listeners, those are twenty seconds you'll never get back. We are here, at the Biz for Unicorns podcast bonus episode. This is a particularly exciting one because Pete is going to surprise me with a topic that he has a strong intuition that I will maybe be able to add something to. So you'll be the judge, listener. Yeah, first, I thought that we could edit. So here we go. I was a hot mess there to start. <laughs> um, today, we are going to talk location selection. We're mm -hmm. going to talk specifically your hard rules, do's and don'ts, as far as identifying the right spot for your space. I have a lot of strong opinions on this. I'd imagine you do as well. And I think we can kind of uh, cover a lot of bases with you hitting the urban market and me having a little bit of experience in the suburban space. Sound good? Yes, let's do it. All right, so um, there isn't really a question per se I've been hit with uh, via Instagram Q&A, so much as multiple people dropping location selection as a term into the topic concepts. So I think the first thing I'll say is that we have let me tell you the first rule Eric had when we started our gym, which I know some people take uh, take issue with when I put on the internet in the past. And I remember the night we were starting, I said, so what do you want? And he was like, I want clean sight lines and I want no mirrors. And anytime I have said that in any forum, the world gets angry with me about the no mirrors thing. Mm -hmm. And this isn't some sort of like hard ass powerlifting gym move that he needed to put in place. He just doesn't want athletes overthinking things when they could be listening to our cues and focusing on how they feel and letting us do the the thinking for them in a sense. And, you know, people aren't standing in front of a mirror ripping off curls. So since 14 plus years ago when we started, we've never had a mirror in our gym. And people think that's crazy. Uh, it's just kind of one of the things that he rolled out there initially. And I don't know that I'd ever build a gym with a mirror outside of the restroom again. So. You have a problem with that statement, Mark? I have a problem with it. It makes me angry. No, I, I don't. I have no problem with it all. I think it's certainly. I think that seems absolutely appropriate based on the avatar and based on the goals of the business. I think certainly, if you're in a different market and if your brand is focused a little bit more on aesthetics, uh, particularly if the physical facility, there are certain aesthetic benefits to having mirrors in a facility. It makes it look bigger. It picks up the light bigger. But this depends, again, on what you're looking to do. So I don't have a problem with that because unlike the internet, I can understand context. And 
I understand that every maxim has the obvious qualifier, but of course there are obvious exceptions. Yes, so. if I had a smaller space and I was dealing with that, I think mirrors are a wonderful way to change the um, perceived square footage, which is nice. But here's the thing to remember, and, and I know that a lot of the listeners here do happen to work in a performance environment. Um, mirrors break and kids and athletes who train in performance training gyms like to break things. And so yes. it, to an extent, it's a, it's a budget restraining solution for me because our clients just, they're not disrespectful people, but they're disrespectful to the space uh, on many, many occasions. And I feel like if I put up a mirror, it would break inside of 48 hours of me putting it there. Someone would like lean a trap bar against it or, you know, yeah. something stupid would happen. And so that's our thing. Now, not to get caught up on mirrors too, too much. I think we should talk about the clean sight, li sight lines concept because I've seen a lot of gym owners, yourself included, compromise on the optimal space because real estate is what it is. And sometimes you got to, you know, knock a hole in the wall and take the room next door and make it work, yep. which we have been uh, fortunate enough to avoid because we we want clean sight lines for one simple reason. We want to be able to theoretically coach from any spot in the gym. And being able to do that means that we can keep uh, our staff size a little small, smaller than it might otherwise be if we had blind spots and we need to responsibly make sure that we can see where people are. But every time we've picked out a spot since location number two, because we compromised on location number one, We've looked for a square or a rectangle. We have looked to situate the equipment in a way that allows us to not have them, you know, move around to see around a corner, things like that. You could, in theory, yell across our gym to someone doing something stupid, so long as you can see them. And that that might be the most important rule we have in place as far as how we select where we're going to end up setting up a gym. Yeah, I have to imagine that one is less controversial because I can't imagine argument against having clear sight lines except for the art of the possible. So if I'm offering mm -hmm. the urban environment, obviously I can tell you firsthand it is both less than ideal and sometimes that's just what you have to do. So in our dragon lair, which is our primary space where we do our small group personal training, there is a very poorly placed bathroom in the center of the space. And we've considered at times actually getting rid of the bathroom but we have sometimes in excess of 100 people coming and going over a two hour period between all the spaces. And that means we would go from four total, five total bathrooms to four total bathrooms, which we don't think we can swing. So it is less than ideal. And I assume that's less controversial than mirrors. Yeah, to paint a picture of just how different the world is that you and I live in, those, those 100 people coming and going over a two hour span would qualify as a probably top 2% day for us as far as foot traffic goes. 100 bodies, well, 100 clients through the gym is is about as good a day as we're going to do. We've run it up to, I think in Massachusetts, our record's 147 in a day, but sure. that's not the norm. We, To me, I, can, I constitute anything above 80 sessions a busy day. And whereas for you, that's a average time slot it sounds <laughs> yeah yeah i would say like 80 a day would be we close very quickly um i will offer two quick considerations that relate a little bit to mirror specifically and then broadly around pete's comment that everyone destroys everything one micro pro tip is if you decide to go to mirrors which i think again there's strong arguments for and against one thing that would be important to do this sounds very silly but particularly if it's a space with weights and plates you do not want the mirror to go down to the floor the mirror should be a, a little bit above. I think I heard that from Mike Boyle, a couple feet above the floor, because the reality is you don't need that to the floor space anyway. And they, your clients are going to, unfortunately, often put the plates against the mirror, which is not great, and it's going to break them. Related to everything being destroyed, I think another thing that is worth understanding for those of you that have a new facility or are about to open facility, after a unfortunately sad short period of time, everything is gonna start breaking. So one thing that is useful to do is, what we do at MFF is every month, a certain percentage of our revenue goes towards a drip account because you're gonna constantly be needing to reinvest in the space. And it's one of those things that can feel unfair and be surprising because you think, oh, I just dumped in X dollars in the space. Now I'm good, we don't have to do anything again. And that's just not true. And I'm not even talking about the, probably unhelpful over investing in 
equipment that sometimes the gym owner or the trainer finds sexy that is meaningless to the client. I'm actually just talking about making sure the place is not literally falling apart and that you have a functional space. So that is another thing I think to consider. Yeah, it stings. The, um, it's funny, I've had the same power racks in our space without damage at any point since day one in 2007. They, they look the same today as they did, we'll say a year in, okay? Uh, so those aren't the things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The $2,500 investments actually hold up pretty well. It's the foam roller that looks like you have like, like rats have been leaving yeah. poops all over the turf <laughs> and yeah. the, that kind of stuff. Or it's the fraying bands. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's the little things that don't sting in an individual one-off purchase. But when you look around, you realize you're replacing them twice a year. That can catch you off guard, but it's definitely yeah. worth noting that we go into this thinking there's an initial build out investment. And then once it's there, you're good until the end of time. And that could not be more false. Sadly, no. And not only that, but one thing that's important to understand is as a signifier for the level of care you have for your facility, things like frayed bands matter. So specifically, uh, frayed bands, foam rollers, yoga blocks, Airx pads, a lot of saw, anything that is not made of metal is going to decay. And it's the good news is on the one hand, it's not a massive investment to keep that stuff fresh. However, you really do benefit from being intentional about that and not letting things look too ratty. Because particularly in a gym, it's never been more important than ever for things to feel clean. And that's the kind of thing that can really impact not only your, I think, client's subconscious experience of the care going in the facility, but certainly your prospect's subconscious experience of the care that goes in the facility when they see that kind of stuff getting tattered. Yeah, part of me wonders if we're seeing an acceleration and deterioration of this equipment because of the degree of cleaning we are doing with it and the chemicals we're pouring all over these these soft foams. And mm -hmm. I I was noticing in our gym just the other day that the Airx pads seem a little more brittle than I remember them, but they have also been abused with our right. antimicrobial spray right. like never before for the last 18 months. So. Uh, that might even accelerate these headaches that we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's kick into a conversation on parking, which you don't deal with um, <laughs> yes, regularly. I, have to offer I there. think it's <laughs> well worthy of note because I think that you're more the exception than the rule in being like the, mm -hmm. the most urban it gets space. And I see, even in the Unicorn Society, uh, when we're having conversations with with coaches or, or I should say business owners who are in the group, people are very quick to compromise on parking space volume that is advertised to them while they're considering a space and embracing a we'll make it work mentality uh, because they fall so in love with the unit in question. And then they say, well, six, six parking spots for our semi-private model, we'll make it work. No one's going to count what we're using. and And they don't realize that they're not adding friction for themselves. They're adding friction for their clients. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're kind of willfully disregarding a very important piece of the puzzle. And landlords, while they're not out there with like a clicker counting how many spots your clients are using, they do know that when the neighbors, you know, the other ten tenants are bitching that the gym down the road is taking up all the parking spots and clients are being disrespectful of the space. It just creates a toxic kind of living environment for you, the gym owner. So when when you do these numbers for yourself and you ask, like, how many parking spaces do we really need? I do think you need to work off of a worst case scenario. And that's your baseline of how many parking spots you need, because you forget that if you want to bring in a complimentary service offering, let's say you want to bring independent contractors in to do PT in your space or something like that. You're just amplifying the, the needs that you have. And it just, it's a headache that I find people dealing with to the point where it's, they've got a wonderful footprint that they're considering stepping away from just because they don't have any place to put the people who want to arrive. Mm -hmm. Maybe not something, uh, well, I'd imagine something you discuss, but not something you deal with in the busiest city on the planet, arguably. Yes, I have no firsthand <laughs> experience with that being in midtown Manhattan. <laughs> what kind of experience or what kind of thoughts do you have on, um, we'll say, things like restroom and locker room maintenance? Because we learned during our process, we kind of 
unintentionally stumbled into a dynamic in Massachusetts where we have community restrooms and showers. So we pay cam charges on our space. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes in and cleans them at night, replaces the toilet paper, makes sure the water's good, there's soap, all these things. And we don't even think about it. And then Eric and Anna got up and running down in Florida with our colleagues and realized they're, that kind of concept from a commercial business space isn't as common as it is here in the Northeast. And they couldn't find any place like that. And so suddenly we're cleaning our own bathrooms and yeah. we're budgeting for that stuff. And us performance facility owners weren't prepped for that. So can you kind of walk me through how you coach people up on anticipating those expenses, uh, contracting out those responsibilities if necessary, things like that, that I didn't see coming into our 2014 transition to Florida? Yeah. You know, it's an interesting question because I haven't actually had a lot of opportunity to coach up anybody on considering that because frankly, by the time I work with somebody, they have the space. It's very rare that I'm talking to somebody that is in the process of finding a space because the unicorn society definitionally it's one of the requirements in fact that you already have a space and occasionally when i do some one-off consulting for a personal trainer usually we're focused more on lead generation and more broadly growing the business so i don't have a ton to offer there because once again mf is a little bit unconventional in that our hell's kitchen space doesn't have a bathroom or doesn't have the showers now we spent a bunch of money i think in 2013 or 14 to draw plans to get them put in and then found out, unfortunately, in our space, it's illegal. It's not a thing that we can do. So for better, or for worse, we haven't really had to deal with that. We did have it in Bowery. It was nice to have. And I personally always, and this is a little bit specific to, I think, probably the New York City market, was always having a little bit of an internal dialogue around, is the benefit of having the shower worth the cost of the extra cleaning and complexity and the carrying expense of having one in there, right? Are we going to garner enough additional business or the inversion? Are we going to be losing sufficient business to make that investment worthwhile? As it happens, it's an academic conversation, Hell's Kitchen. And New York City in general, particularly for the down and dirtier boutique fitness market, there is more, I think, precedent now for people opening up facilities where they don't have the showers. And I think a lot of this conversation comes down to your particular market and particularly where the location is. Definitionally, in New York, people are just not traveling that far. And even as much as a place like MFF is a little bit infamous for people being willing to travel very far, which is true, the fact of the matter is most people are within walking distance of their home. They're not even driving there. So it's it's certainly not as convenient as if there was a shower there. And certainly we have people terminate over it. We have people decide to not sign up over it. So I don't mean to underplay it, but in our market, it's been less of an issue because New Yorkers in general, I think are accustomed to dealing with all manner of inconvenience that the rest of the country finds breathtaking. <laughs> the headaches you guys deal with would keep me up at night every single night of the year, yeah. <laughs> especially during your Bowery build out. I think I was anxious about your situation oh, yeah. and I was uh, hundreds of miles away. Um, okay. Uh, I want to kick on to another location selection topic, get your take. Uh, in this case, I myself have run into some minor, not deal breaker issues on noise. Mm -hmm. What kind of conversations mm -hmm do you think people should be thinking about having with their potential landlords leading into an agreement? Because I think this part is um, over, an oversight that we understandably make when we're new to the gym ownership game. Yes, I think this is a thing that, again, I could speak to the urban market is a very big deal in urban markets because it is very rare that you have a standalone warehouse space. That's just not going to happen. So it's something that needs to be addressed ASAP-ish. It's also why, and I'll give like a, a broader thought, then I'll circle back to this particular, particular issue. It is one of the reasons why I think it is useful before you begin your search to develop and then refine over time a set of do or die terms that you're in dialogue with your broker about. Now, this is a thing that is recommended for actually residential real estate investment. If you're looking to buy properties as rental income, or even to flip, you want to get very clear on what are the terms, exactly what you're looking for. So at a place like Mark Fisher Fitness, at this point, when we go back to looking for spaces, which may happen sooner rather than later, because there's some opportunities right now in the market, we have very specific terms 
around the amount of space we need. We need, you know, it has to be between X and X square footage. We're willing to pay up to X and not a penny more. We know the ceilings need to be 10 feet. And one of those things in our terms are, we're usually looking at the first floor end or basement because it's very difficult to drop weights on the second floor and higher. It does happen. There are gyms that have done that. And generally speaking, we want to be in a commercial property for that very reason. They're all manner of horror stories uh, in the New York City, it happens all the time where gyms literally go down because they have the misfortune of opening up in the first floor of a co-op building with a lot of wealthy lawyers that live in the building that just completely take down the gym. So in addition to looking at the terms of the lease and sort of what protections you have, it's all usually, at least in New York City, we also have to hire an acoustic engineer. You have to have someone come in and do tests. And usually you have to do soundproofing. And we, when we opened up Hell's Kitchen, we didn't have that. And in retrospect, it was unforgivable because I had been on the second floor of our building because I used to live on the third floor for a long time. And it was deafening. And I could not believe that these four delightful young finance bros jammed in this beautiful luxury apartment were willing to put up with it for as long as they were because we would blast it like a rock concert all day long every day. And then eventually we just put in um, soundproofing on the ceiling, which mitigates it to some extent, but I still think probably not perfectly. So uh, so those are some considerations about that. I'm wondering how you think about that in non-urban markets. This falls under the category of we were naive and lucky and we learned the hard way briefly. So our first space was a handshake agreement subletting a corner of a pitching and batting cage facility in the town that we're currently in. We had about 2,500 square feet, shade less than that. And it was on the third floor. And we were actually only there from July of 2007 until May of 2008 before we outgrew it. And during that window of time, we are now in hindsight, very fortunate to have run into a lot of complaints from the property. Uh, the ballet studio beneath us didn't like us. The uh, landlords especially hated us because we were subletting space. So we didn't even have an agreement in place with them. And we were just creating headaches for them, but not cutting them rent checks. And we identified the next spot we wanted to go to. We talked to the landlord, Jim, very kind man, still um, I consider a business partner of sorts today, uh, 14 years later. And we got right to the edge of signing a lease with Jim. And we said, Jim, we're not signing anything until you come out to our current space. And we want you to hear it from the hallway. We want you to hear it from the street. We want you to hear it from immediately outside the door. We want you to watch what's going on while we trained as a staff because that was when we really trained like assholes and we mm. were, you know, lifting too much weight stupidly and dropping weights. And it was acting like power lifters basically. And so we said, if you can come in, listen to the music, hear the noise, watch the chaos, and then walk out of here saying, I'm at peace with this coming into my building. We're going to build language into the co into the lease that says uh, noise complaints from fellow tenants are your responsibility to deal with, not mine. And he said, I'm at peace with that. And uh, I think he overshot his own kind of expectations for his building. Like, ah, it's so structurally sound. It's way newer yeah. than this industrial mill we were in. There are going to be no issues. So he he put the language in. We were at peace with it. We walk in. I think we we're 48 hours into being there. And the guy across the hall stomps into our, our office. And he says, where's the owner? I need to talk to the owner. We're like, oh, my God, here we go. And wow. uh, of course, we played nice. I mean, we're, we're new to town. We're going to be nice and respectful. But we had to respectfully say, um, we did anticipate these discussions. And Jim, who I know you know well, because you write him checks as well, has agreed to be the point man on conversations of this nature. So allow me to loop him into this conversation. And then we stepped away. And uh, that ultimately resulted in Jim investing pretty heavily in soundproofing our space uh, inside of the first six months we were there. And also us very willingly and happily reconfiguring the space in a way that situated things like deadlifts and dropping dumbbells mm -hmm. in a spot that wasn't reverberating through an I-beam and up across the building. And, right. and we didn't, we weren't asking for permission to be disrespectful. We were just trying to wash our hands of inevitable, difficult conversations. So 
if you have the flexibility to make an ask of that nature, I think anything's fair game when you're negotiating a lease. So that's a conversation that I can't emphasize enough. Have it. It's it's a big one. And uh, it'll just kind of take some stress off your plate because you're going to make noise. There's just there's very little way around it. And uh, ultimately, it wasn't a deal breaker, but it could have created some pretty significant headaches for me because mm-hmm. I didn't want to be in like mediation with the neighbor across the hall or something yeah. like that surrounding our new space. But I said we were just lucky there. We were young, naive kids who were just like making it up as we went. No one told me to think about that. We just we got lucky. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think if you can figure that out, that is awesome. And, you know, that'll be an interesting thing, too, because in practice, I have to imagine that no landlord should ever have accepted that deal. Um, and if you're lucky enough to deal with a landlord, you know, there are pros and cons to how sophisticated a landlord is or it isn't, quite frankly. And if you can get some of that in your lease, I think that is amazing. And those of you in urban markets, if you have a landlord with any experience, I have a feeling that's going to be harder for you to pull off. But might as well ask. Might as well ask. Yeah, when you get out here into the burbs, you're not dealing with massive property holding management companies. And it's, um, in my experience, these have been more mom and pop relationships that we're managing. And I look, if he came to me and he said, this is untenable, can we figure out a solution alternative? I would have, I would have done that. He's been a wonderful person. And like I said, I think of him as a partner in our business. I mean, we've, we've written over a million dollars in rent checks to that guy Mm -hmm. over the years. So it's not like he lost on the deal, but uh, I brought some headaches to the table for him for sure. But that's what you get when you let a bunch of 25 year olds open a gym right, in your space right. with with eight months of experience. So uh, he's along for the ride just like we are. Yeah, and I think that's another good point too that I think is commonly underappreciated, which led to a lot of issues for a lot of people in the past 18 months is really curating and developing and nurturing your relationship with your landlord. Now, to Pete's point, That is not something that is as easy to do if you're dealing with an international conglomerate, right? So if you're in New York, it is unfortunately possible that you're renting from a very small subdivision of a German hedge fund that's diversified by buying up blocks of New York City. And then that's harder to do. But even then, you will have a point of contact. It doesn't hurt to grease that wheel and develop that relationship and really make sure you're on good terms. If you are in a situation, you have more of a mom and pop situation. And to some extent, I don't know that I would call my (laughs) Chris New York mom and pop per se. I mean, because he's a New York landlord, but I deal with the guy that owns the company. He's the landlord. We have each other's phone number. We have a personal relationship. Uh, If anything, we're much closer after the last 18 months or we've had to sort of come through for each other a number of times in a number of different ways. And that is a type of social capital that I think is easy to underappreciate until you really need it. And again, it's one of those dumb how to win friends and influence people, Dale Carnegie, just business 101, just be a nice person, just like develop friendships, take an interest in the sum as a human, be empathetic, understanding that They're doing the best they can. And even if you don't have the opportunity to speak directly with the person that owns the business, even then, I think it would behoove you to really develop a relationship with whoever the point person is. And again, admittedly, I'm not saying that's always possible. Even if at Bowery, we ran into the issue where the business was, the building was sold and we weren't there that long. We were only there for a few years, but the first, there were one older owners, then they sold it to a larger company and you know, that, that it is going to be a little bit harder based on the particular setup, but it's really in your best interest to develop a relationship with your landlord and not look at it as a purely transactional situation because you don't know when you're going to need them. And to some extent, you, know, you might be in a position to help them sometimes is uh, unfortunately for uh, without going into the details and sharing things aren't my business. It's It's been a tough go for my landlord for obvious reasons in the past 18 months, too. I totally get it. Two things on the landlord discussion. One, um, I find it's it's common to come across gym owners, myself included, who are in a property where the property is kind of actively on the market for extended periods. Like they're entertaining the idea of moving it. Anyone who's holding property these days is kind of like, well, this might be the time to sell this. Mm -hmm. It seems pretty ridiculous what I could get for it. Um, And if your landlord asks to show your space, obviously the writing's pretty much on the wall there. If something like a, this conglomerate is looking at the building. Um, we came to our landlord when this first started and we didn't know kind of what the game plan was. And he was pretty transparent. He's like, I'm I'm dipping my toe in the water, but this might happen. And, and I said, well, what does that mean for us and our lease? He said, they'll honor your lease, but I can't make any promises beyond that. 
And so we said, hey, um, what are the odds we could tear up our lease right now and and consider investing in something longer term with you? At least it, it helps you from an occupancy standpoint, but it helps me because I have the sanity of knowing I'm negotiating with you and not someone else. Mm -hmm. And he did that. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't do that maybe a year into a five-year lease, but we were like four years into a five-year lease. And I liked our terms, but I also kind of wanted to insulate myself from that potential downside of having a New York property owner come in and just tell us this is yeah. just the way it's going. Yeah. Um, yeah. The second thing I was going to say that I can't emphasize enough to people, um, if you're on the cusp of signing a lease, ask to speak with other tenants about their experience in the property. And I might even say, ask the landlord first and he'll handpick his favorites and then go knock on the door of someone else in the building that he didn't point you toward and just say, hey, can I have two minutes of your time? I'm entertaining the idea of signing a lease here. Can you tell me about your experience working with the landlord? Certainly no pressure. Um, in our building, there's well over 200,000 square feet of, of space and it's impossible to find a 100% satisfaction rate. There's definitely owners in our building who are like, Jim sucks. He's he's been nothing but unreasonable from the start. But then there are people who, like us who are like, I'd have Jim to Thanksgiving dinner at my house. Mm -hmm. I I mean the guy the guy bought like gifts for me on my wedding, and when we had kids, he he bought the same like radio flyer wagon for every kid that Eric and I <laughs> had over the years, and like he just cares. So you're going to get a variety of feedback, but if there is a continuing theme that is like, hey, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Uh, that's certainly worth listening to, but not enough people like we, we call references on jobs, but we don't on landlords. That's kind of crazy to me. So think about that if you're getting close. Yeah. I think calling references on any kind of partner and vendor is a highly underrated pro move. And that's one of the things that I think relates to this conversation is if, and when you're in the place where you're hiring contractors and or architects and, or anybody that's going to be doing meaningful work on a space and, there are probably some strong arguments that don't take a space if you can avoid that needs a lot of work. It's another thing I've learned in a difficult way. Uh, it, I think checking in on references for that kind of stuff makes perfect sense. That's very important. So we're trying to keep this one to be a quick hitter. I want to know if there's anything that you feel like I left off since I clearly drove mm -hmm. the agenda here. Any hard rules, like tons of natural light, or you mentioned yeah. ceiling height, things like that. I mean, we're so used to being so flexible in New York that I don't have super, super hard rules. And to some extent, the exact square footage you need depends a little bit on your model. Certainly, you know, ceiling height is a thing that matters. And if you're looking at basement spaces that can run into issues. And usually, you know, my rule of thumb there is I just need a very tall person to be able to press a barbell overhead safely or jump safely. Um, I think another thing, two other things when we're talking about site selection matter, I think first of all, I was on a talk for perform the other day and we were on a panel and one of the questions that came up was how do you know if you're ready to open up your own facility? And there's a number of different ways to look at that. But one thing that there was kind of, agreement on amongst the panel was ideally you're not operating from the building they will come school ideally you're developing a base of business somehow some way whether you're renting space somewhere else or you're in a sublease or something before you bite the bullet right this is not to say that you can't go all in and maybe you're really amazing at pre-launch strategies or you're moving to a new town you have no choice and that certainly can be a thing that happens but ideally you I think want to consider where is your existing clientele and that needs at least be part of your decision making process when you're considering physically where the space goes. The other thing that I think is worth considering here is understanding real estate as a percentage of your anticipated revenue. Now, forecasting is difficult, particularly when and even people that are business experts are not good at forecasting. No one actually knows what's going to happen. <laughs> That's the ugly truth. And it's a little bit hard to admittedly when this stuff is all new for you, particularly if you are the, you know, archetypal personal trainer that is making the leap and getting your own space. Sometimes that's not always the type of individual that's a real whiz with spreadsheets and forecasting and projections. But one considered best practice that my bookkeeping team suggests for the fitness industry broadly is that ideally your rent is no more than 12.5% of your revenue. So 
I think in different mar- different parts of the country, you can probably get that a little bit lower. I think in New York City, that's probably always going to be a little bit of wishful thinking and probably not super realistic. But I think that is another thing that is worth you considering as you do this is when you look at that space, realistically, is there a world where you can get that revenue, you know, 12.5, the revenue that you're 10xing whatever you're paying on rent? And if not, that's again, probably a thing that you want to be considering because Uh, particularly in urban markets. Another thing that I will put on your radar is there's a lot of understandable focus on price per square foot, right? Which just means how much is this per square foot based on comparable spaces in this particular neighborhood? And that's all well and good. And I think that is a thing to consider. But at the end of the day, for me, I don't actually care about the price per square foot because, and here's why, I might have a 6,000 square foot property and a 4,000 square foot property. And if I know I'm putting in, and just giving you like MFFE types of things, I'm putting in one small group personal training room and one classroom, and each of them have X capacity. I might be able to fit in the same room, two rooms in the 4,000 square foot or the 6,000 square foot. So the 6,000 square foot might be actually a pretty decent price per square foot when compared to other options. But at the end of the day, I don't really actually care about that. I just care about how much money I make, right? And I care about taking care of my clients, obviously. Right? <laughs> uh, it's not just about money, everybody, but it's partly about money. So that is why I think price per square foot is definitely a consideration. But I think people get a little bit blinded about that. I know I don't know that that's as I'd be curious to hear if that's a thing that's considered as much in less urban markets. But I know in New York, everybody hammers that and I do not care. I care about how much is my rent per month. And then how how can I monetize that space? How many people are going to be able to fit in? Um, that's more my consideration. It's something I would encourage you to consider as you look at your spaces. Yeah, and let's not forget that you can't take care of your clients if you sign a backbreaking irresponsible lease. So <laughs> the money piece is important. Uh, I'll leave you with one more little pro tip tidbit we learned by mistake as well. And then we can call it there. Um, the age of the space you're considering and the um the infrastructure matters my the building we're in half of it was built in 1968 and half of it was built in 1998 uh the first four years we were in a space in the space which we're now approaching 10 years in our new part um we were in the inefficient the inefficient part of the building and didn't realize it we moved from 7600 square feet to 15100 square feet and my cost of uh, utilities and things like heat and air conditioning went up by less than 10% when we more than doubled our footprint hmm. and it was because we went into a space that had the energy star approved lights and better insulation and just plain newer materials and I budgeted for a 2x of all of those things. And I was very fortunate to see that old buildings are old. <laughs> and so it's something worth keeping an eye on as you're considering all of these things. Because those utilities, they will start to accumulate pretty quickly. Yeah. And and old lights eat a lot of electricity. So something yeah. to think about there. The, the electricity, the utilities are another factor that can be frustrating because depending on the facility, sometimes it's very hard to really guesstimate that before you're in there and the variance can be wild. Uh, fun facts, I know we're bringing this close, uh, which is not even a fun fact. It's not a bragging. It's maybe more like a complaint or another yet another war story. We for years could not understand why the electricity at Bowery was so expensive. And then we finally found out in the last year and a half after we closed Bowery, that's because we were getting charged all kinds of things for other people in the building. And Con Edison owes us like $20,000 or something ludicrous. And we are now still uh, 18 months later, still calling them on a regular basis. They've confirmed they owe us the money. They keep saying they're gonna write us a check and keep not doing it. Uh, And God bless her, Nikki Switzer, who is our finance manager for a long time, who works with us on a consultant basis right now. It's actually her consultant job is on a weekly basis. (laughs) She's just calling Con Ed, uh, which is gonna be hilarious because I I imagine a lot of that money is gonna just go to pay Nikki for just constantly being on the phone with Con Ed. uh, wow, it's a really weird world out there, friends. You gotta you gotta look out for yourself. It's a weird world. Yeah, just on principle, you gotta win that battle. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I'm like, I don't even care if like Nikki gets all of it. I'm like, give us our money. 
All right. All right. Should we call it there? We'll call it there. Thank you so much, as always, for checking us out here on the Business for Unicorns podcast. As always, it means so much when you do the things. Subscribe, leave us a review, like us, send your friends your way. Thanks for listening, as always, and we will catch you in a podcast soon. Goodbye, all. Hey, friends, before you go, just one more thing. Um, If you enjoy this podcast, you get value out of it, you enjoy listening, please share this podcast. Comment below. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe. Uh, Please share it with friends and family. We don't spend any money on marketing or advertising. And so um, so the only way people find out about this podcast is from you. So please do everything you can to share it with friends and uh, fellow colleagues in the fitness industry. Uh, We love making it, and we want to keep doing it for a long, long time. So I appreciate your support. Go have a kick-ass day. Bye.